Hello students, welcome to this session in which we are going to solve the science sample papers. Now this is the sample paper, the most recent one which CBSE has released to help you out with your board exam preparations. We are going to do a detailed solution of all the questions. Let's get started. Before we get started, let's quickly look at the pattern of the question paper that you are going to get in your board exams. So the paper is going to have five sections in total and in section one you get 20 objective questions and every question has one mark in section B you have six very short questions and each question has two mark uh, carries a weight of two mark section C similarly has seven questions of three marks each section D has three long answer type questions five marks each okay Section E, uh, you're going to have some paragraph based questions or comprehension based questions or you can call them case based questions, source based questions, many different names. Okay, uh, This is in alignment with the new education policy that the government has released, the national education policy. So I'll give you a brief about uh, the national education policy, what the government has proposed. The government is planning to have learning through assessments also. So right now, assessments are just used for testing whether you have completely understood a chapter or not. Uh, but the government is proposing to use assessments for learning as well. And on that route, it has proposed something called competency-based questions. These competency-based questions are going to test you on your understanding of the on your understanding of the subject. So section E of this question paper has some similar questions which are aligned to the national education policy. Okay, uh, let's get started with this. Section A, let's look at the first question. <clears throat> so we have uh, two chemicals, sodium sulfate and barium chloride. So sodium sulfate has the formula Na2SO4 and barium chloride is barium BaCl2 and uh, once these two react we're going to have a double displacement reaction we, uh, sodium chloride this will result in sodium chloride and barium sulfate it's a double displacement reaction right double displacement the action. The question is asking which of these two products, NaCl or barium sulfate, which of these two represent a solid state? In other words, it's asking which of these will appear as a precipitate in your product? Well, we all know NaCl is salt and we if you, even if you don't know much about barium sulfate, you can still answer this question. I'll tell you how. Look at the picture that's associated with the question. Both the solutions or both the reactants are aqueous, right? We can notice that from the picture. Both are in water. We know that salt is soluble in water. So this is not going to appear as a precipitate. So what is going to appear as a precipitate? The other one. Even if you had no clue about this, you could still answer this. And the answer is going to be barium sulfate. So this is your answer. Okay. Let's move on to the second question. Uh, the color of the solution observed after 30 minutes of placing zinc metal into copper sulfate solution. An interesting question. Well, uh, we all know that copper sulfate is a blue colored solution. When you put zinc in the solution, zinc being more reactive than copper will displace the copper from copper sulfate. It will form zinc sulfate and copper gets separated from the solution. So copper was the metal that was bringing in the blue color in the original solution. 
if copper gets separated and you have zinc sulfate, well, zinc sulfate does not have a characteristic color. So if copper gets out, the blue color goes away. So what happens is, uh, the final solution would become colorless. Okay, the color of the solution observed after 30 minutes. We have given sufficient time. So all the copper will kind of come out. Zinc will replace all the copper and the blue color will go away. That's the solution to the second question. Let's move on to the third one. Which of these four options is a mild non-corrosive basic salt? So here's a quick revision for you. How do we get basic salt? So there are three kinds of salts, neutral salt, acidic salts, basic salts. I hope you remember how we get these salts. Neutral salts, we get neutral salts when strong acid and strong base react. Uh, this results in neutral salt. Okay, acidic salt. Acidic salt, when a strong acid reacts with a weak base, that's when you get a, an acidic salt. Okay, uh, basic salt, very simple, a weak acid and a strong base. This will give you a basic salt. Now, let's come to the question. The question is asking, which of these is a non-corrosive basic salt? Even if you have no idea about corrosion, that means if it's non-corrosive, it has to be weak. So when you dissolve it in water, it should result in either a weak acid or a weak base. That's when it has to be non-corrosive. Most probably it has to result in a weak acid. Okay, it has to result in a weak acid. Okay, so let's try dissolving all of these four salts and see what we are getting. Calcium hydroxide. The first option is calcium hydroxide. Well, it's not even a salt. Calcium hydroxide is a base. So this is not our answer. Uh, look at the second option, NaCl, okay, it's a salt, NaCl. How do I know whether this has formed from a strong acid or a weak acid? Try dissolving this in water. If you dissolve NaCl in water, you are going to get HCl. HCl is a strong acid. So if it's made from strong acid, you see, strong acid plus any kind of base is definitely not a basic salt. Okay, so this cannot be your answer. About the third one, third option is NaOH. It's a base. It's not a salt. So you can ignore this also. The first one is also not the answer. Let's look at the final one. Uh, which is sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate when dissolved in water will give you carbonic acid and carbonic acid is a weak acid we all know that so this salt has formed from a weak acid we can see that weak acid and a strong base of course because sodium is there so weak acid and strong base that means it must be this is the one i'm looking for this is the one i'm looking for this is my answer option d let's move on to the next question question number four on adding dilute sulfuric acid to a test tube containing a metal a colorless gas is released and it's also given that this colorless gas burns when a matchstick, when a burning matchstick is brought near the mouth of the test tube. So let's draw the schematic first. So here's our test tube and here's some granules of the metal. In this, we're pouring H2SO4 
and it releases a gas. After reacting, it's going to release a gas. So basically the exercise is to identify that gas. If you remember, sodium when it reacts with H2SO4 or the sulfuric acid, it releases hydrogen. It releases the hydrogen gas. Sulfur also releases a gas. Do you remember the name? Sulfur when reacting with uh, sulfuric acid produces sulfur dioxide. In fact, copper and silver also produce the same gas, SO2. Okay, so these three produce SO2, whereas sodium produces hydrogen. But you should know that sulfur dioxide is not a combustible gas, so it's not going to burn. It, it's not going to burn itself. Also, it has a rotten egg smell, and there's nothing given about the smell. Right? It's a colorless gas, it says, and it's pointing out towards hydrogen. And the main point which indicates that it must be hydrogen gas is that it's, a, it's colorless and it's brought, it burns when it is brought near the mouth of the test tube. So we have identified our answer and that is option number A. It must be sodium. Sodium, when reacts with uh, sulfuric acid, produces hydrogen, hydrogen and hydrogen burns. Okay, hydrogen is combustible. Let's look at the next question now. So, we have been given electronic uh, configuration of uh, some atoms and we have to find out whether this compound, sodium oxide, is represented by any of the four options given to us. Uh, first of all, what is the valency of sodium? It's one, okay? It's a group one element. The valency is one. What is the valency of oxygen? It's a group six element and has a valency two. First, the valency of sodium, just sodium, is one. And the valency of oxygen not oxide mind you okay valency of oxygen is 2 if you want to write it with signs it's minus 2 and it's plus 1 so these are the valencies sodium oxide is represented by Na2O we should know that because you know we have to form 8 electrons in the outermost orbit we have to put eight electrons there six electrons oxygen is bringing with it one electron one sodium atom brings with it so na2o is the correct is the correct chemical formula and which of these four options a b c or d is showing that there are two sodium and one oxygen atoms which of these it's option number b this is the answer, see, two sodium and one oxygen. Let's move on to the next question. An element with atomic number, we have to guess the atomic number, will form a basic oxide. So which of these elements will form a basic oxide? So basically, we have to figure out what is the group of these elements? What is the group of these four elements. The element with atomic number 7. Look at its electronic configuration 2,5. It is in the fifth group. The first one, okay. What about the second element? It has an atomic number 17 and its electronic configuration is also given 287. Seven. The third one, if you look at it, is in the fourth group. And the fifth one, uh, uh, sorry, and the and option number D, that means the element having atomic number 11 is, it must be in the first group. Now, if it's in the first group, that's the one that would form a basic oxide. Because what we have studied, that all the elements, not all the elements, but most of the elements in group 1 and group 2 have the propensity of forming basic oxides. So, this is 
the answer. Let's move on to question number seven. So an element M has 50% of the electrons filled in the third shell. 50% of the number of electrons which are there in the second shell. That's how many electrons are there in the third shell. Now think, if it needs to go to the third shell, that means the second shell must be complete. It must be completely filled up, right? Well, let's see how many electrons are there in every shell. It says that M has half the number of electrons in the third shell. That means the second shell must be filled completely, right? If the second shell is filled completely, that means it would have eight electrons. And in the third shell, the question says it has 50% of those many, so four electrons. If we are going on to second and third shells, that means the first shell must be filled already. And we all know that the first shell can contain only two electrons. If we add those up, we get 8 plus 2, 10, 10 plus 4, 14 electrons. 14 electrons, 14 protons will form an element that has an atomic number of 14. So that's your answer. Okay, moving on to question number 8 now. Okay, let's solve question number 8 now. The question asks, which of these four organisms amoeba, mushroom, paramecium or lice digest food outside their bodies. Amoeba, though a single cell, cell organism, engulfs the food and then digests it. So it digests the food within the body itself. If you look at mushrooms, they don't have a digestive system. So what they do is they release some digestive enzymes in their surroundings once those enzymes break things down, then they absorb those broken nutrients. So it must be mushroom. Uh, I would suggest you go back and revise how paramecium digests it, its food. It's a very interesting uh, process. Uh, but one thing I can tell you that it digests food within their bodies, inside their bodies. Lice is a multicellular organism. It also digests food inside its body. So we are done with question number eight. Let's look at question number nine now. Receptors are usually located in sense organs. We all know that, yes. Gustatory receptors, where are they present? Well, anything gustatory relates to the digestive system. We all know that, right? And which of these four organs listed here relates to the digestive system? It's the tongue because that's the inlet of uh, food. So you take food from your mouth. In your mouth you have your tongue. That's where your gustatory receptors also are present. Okay, uh, let's move on to question number 10 now. So question 10 says that a farmer wants to grow banana banana plants genetically similar enough to the plants that already are there uh, in his field. Which of the following methods would be best? Well, let's do a quick recap of all the four methods. What is regeneration? We use tissues uh, to grow the plant. So we're going down to the very basics, you know, cells and tissues. And the offsprings that emerge from there will not necessarily be genetically similar to the local uh, variety, okay? So regeneration is definitely not a method to produce genetically similar plants. This keyword is very important for this question. The second method is budding. Well, budding can produce genetically similar enough plants, but to do this on a large scale, given that it's a farmer, uh, is going to be very tedious. So I would hold on to this. Let's look at what are the other options. Uh, the third option is saying vegetative propagation. Okay, interesting option. 
See, this method involves using vegetative plant parts like rhizomes, uh, combs, suckers, etc. Uh, to grow new plants, right? These offsprings, these rhizomes and suckers I was talking about, these are genetically identical to the parent plant. So, if you are growing plant from these offsprings, you would get genetically similar plants. So, that would be your so your answer would be vegetative, vegetative propagation and it's very easy to do it on a large scale. So I would discard budding and choose the most appropriate option given which is vegetative propagation. Uh, what about sexual reproduction? Well banana plants don't, uh, don't reproduce by uh, sexual reproduction, they reproduce asexually, right? So and also their seeds are sterile. So even if some seeds develop, they'll result in offspring genetically different from the parent plant. Okay. 